coach. Let's find out if you're ready for love. Here's your marvelous host, Nikki Lee. Hello, and welcome to Ready for Love Radio. This is your host and love coach, Nikki Lee. And today, ladies, I have an interesting treat for you. We are going to talk to a former uh, Cosmo Bachelor of the Month and Bachelor of the Year. And he was in one of, I I admit, one of my favorite magazines, the Alaskan Men magazine. I think we all remember that when Oprah did her her big spiel about that and had all those good-looking men on there. So we are going to talk to, and he's going to correct me if I'm wrong, (laughs) but Michael Mojaleski. Did I get that right, Mike? Absolutely perfect, Nikki. Yes. Okay. I won't get it right again, so let's just stick with that. (laughs) Okay. He said it better than I do. Michael spent a couple of years on an isolated wilderness island in the inner passage of Alaska. Okay, so imagine all of that incredible scenery, the wildlife, all the all the time to get in touch with yourself and to do a lot of soul searching. And, and I would think, I, I told him before we start recording, if you can't be inspired to write something in Alaska, just give it up. So he, he did write a book while he was there. But all of these interesting things were happening at home while he was up there. And, and consider isolated island, all by himself, no women dropping by. And then he comes back and he finds out that he was named uh, Cosmo's Bachelor of the Month and then at one point Man of the Year. And he was also in Alaska Men Magazine. Like I said, I love that magazine. (laughs) So so imagine the culture shock, to say the least, of of being isolated. And I'm sure you were ready for some female companionship by the time you got back to, to civilization. So what in the world was your first reaction when you found out what was going on when you, you came back to, to civilization? Well, I, I totally was sort of like the stranger in the strange land, definitely fish out of water, because for two years I didn't see any females at all, and every full moon I'd be on the beach howling with the wolves, so lonely. Because the beauty of Alaska is there's so much magic that happens. Northern lights dance around your cabin, killer whale jumps right in front of your kayak, and you want to wrap your arms around somebody, preferably female, and jump up and down and howl with joy. And that's the worst part of solitude and being alone, is not to share the magic, to, right. to take it in yourself, not to have someone else to wrap around and share that with. It is, it's and, hard to have incredible experiences and see fantastic things and not, not to even be able to turn to somebody and say, look at that. You know, there's just well, that, that's what really pushed me into my first book is even though I couldn't mail these letters because the post office was so far away, a native reserve where the First Nation people live, um, 12 miles away, but it could take you two days because the ocean was so stormy, that whenever one of these magical experiences would happen, I would immediately go into the cabin, grab a pen and paper, and write it down in the freshness and immediacy of the moment. And then, you know, I would mail these letters maybe a month later when a fishing boat came by or something like that. Awesome. That would, like I said, I I think it would just, there would be unlimited inspiration and and probably harder to figure out what to write about instead of trying to figure out, you know, some some idea. Because I know a lot of people have writer's block. I would think you probably didn't have a lot of writer's block while you were there. No, and, you know, the strange thing is, is that when we get out of our comfort zone, that's when we grow. And talk right. about being in over your head. Before I first ended up on this island, I am, I'm a city slicker from Cleveland, Ohio. I had only gone camping twice before in my life. And there was always a phone nearby to call mom to come and rescue you or, or whatever. I mean, I was 40,000 leagues in over my head, nothing on the resume. And unlike the TV show Survivor, there was nobody else on that island to vote you off and send you home. But what I learned there, William James, a great psychologist, had a a wonderful line, and he said, we as human beings lead lives inferior to ourselves, that we're capable of so much more than we think we can do. And every day I was put... 
I was put to that test. And it's almost as if it was genetic memory. A lot of things that I didn't consciously know I knew or knew what to do, they would just arise up out of the, you know, your, your very DNA or genes or whatever to save your life. And Emerson called it the oversoul, that all human beings are connected and we all share this knowledge no matter where we're born or country or whatever. And I, I kind of tapped into that reservoir. So every day I jump out of bed and I go, okay, you know, what, what am I going to learn about myself and the world that's going to be totally new today? <clears throat> People go, how can you live on that little island? Aren't you bored? It was like bored. In those two years, I probably lived at least 10 lifetimes. You know, I was, I was thinking that while you were talking. I said, you know, I, I don't understand how people can be pretty much anywhere and be bored. I mean, as long as I've got, you know, a, a book or a piece of paper or something handy, I am, I'm never bored. And, and I was just thinking, you know, we, we talked enough that I, I have a feeling you weren't bored when <laughs> you were there. Oh, you know, and anybody that's bored, I go, look out the window, talk to a human being, read a book, take a trip. I mean, I wish we didn't have to sleep at night because those <laughs> six, seven, eight hours, whatever, you know, you could be, uh, at a, what, a third of our lifetime is spent with our eyes closed. I mean, I want those hours, you know. Oh, nice. Wow. But for personal growth, Nikki, it was just <clears throat> absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, the strange thing was, as a writer, which you are, and such a good one, is that I would eventually mail these letters to all points, all four directions to various friends. And everybody kept those letters. So when I came back from the island, I stacked them up by date, and there was the first draft of the book because it had that, that immediacy of writing a letter to somebody. Definitely. So that was a, it, I, I've done that a couple of times when I've, I've done like the final edits of one of my books. I, I strategically chose my locations for my novels of places I wanted to go or had been. And, and right. so the fantastic thing was when I actually, it was like while I was doing the final edits for one of my books and there was a hurricane in the book, and I was actually at the Outer Banks on the East Coast, which is where my book set, and there was a humongous storm for like three days. So, I mean, I was actually submerged in the location and the, the feel and all that kind of stuff that was in the book. So when you're writing about it and you're, you're literally submersed in the atmosphere you're writing about, it's so much more powerful. It can come right. across so much better. So why, and, why and, that, and that energy works its way into your prose. It's yes. just there, you know. Definitely. So to being a city boy, why in the world did you decide to go to the Alaskan wilderness for a couple of years? Well, you know, it kind of started with my mother, and she read me to sleep every single night. Thank goodness. And when I was like four, six, eight years old, growing up Cleveland, Ohio, and they would be like all the world classics of literature and adventure stories and Brothers Grimm. And then one night she read me The Call of the Wild by Jack London. And I don't know why that particular book resonated so much, because here I am so young and surrounded by urbanity or a city. But it did. And the interesting thing that she told me was that when my eyes were closed and my chest was moving up and down with deep breathing, in other words, I'm asleep, she kept reading. And I think it's proven that even though we're asleep, our subconscious never really sleeps. People want to learn a foreign language. They let the tape run all night. And somehow I think we absorb what's going on around us. So she would keep reading. And then when I was uh, later on in life, I saw a great movie with Robert Redford called Jeremiah Johnson. And it's about a total neophyte, rookie, who, and this is set back in the 1880s where there were mountain men scampering around the Rocky Mountains, trapping animals and, you know, living with or fighting the native people. And that movie was so powerful. It was a life changer. I came out of that film and I said, where on earth today in our modern era can I have those same experiences? Well, Alaska is about it, where you have the food chain intact, you've got native people. Be careful what you ask for woman came into my life about two months later, <clears throat> met her by accident, but are there any accidents? I bumped into her back. There were a thousand people in a meadow in Aspen, Colorado, and we were watching a lunch break at a design conference. We were watching hang gliders come off the top of Ajax and land at our feet. And I bumped into her back, turned around, 
but why didn't I bump into the back to the right or to the left? I bumped into the back, the woman who gave me my life and my future, an angel on earth. Architect, Vancouver, British Columbia, never been to California, hitchhike over to L.A., all the way up the coast, two weeks on her sailboat going up this inside passage. And she was the one who introduced me to the man that on the island. So every New Year's Eve, I call Jean Viev and I thank her for giving me my life, my career. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Okay, so you, you get back to civilization, and, and you find out all of these things are going on, and, and you end up having five thousand letters from women. I, I would. You know, the funny thing was. The funny thing, I don't mean to interrupt, but the funny thing was that the phone rang one morning. And here I am, I can't speak, you know, I'm just, I'm like, oh my God, I've I've peed on the beach for two years, and I mean, I'm flushing the toilet, looking at the thing like it's a miracle, like, oh my God, you know, the water (laughs) actually disappears down this pole, and and I would take these 45-minute hot showers, the greatest invention man has ever come up with, you know. Because I had none of that you know, on the island. And so I'm just, all these modern, you know, are all the comforts that we have that we take for granted on a daily basis. I would flick the light switch on and off and go, look, you move this lever and you get light. Instead of having to fire up the kerosene lamps, trim the wicks, you know, all that hard work. Your full-time job is just surviving, you know, every day. Right. So the phone rings and it's Cosmopolitan Magazine. And I laughed and I hung up. And I go, yeah, right, who is this really? And the phone rang again. And then it was Cosmo, and the the editor said, hey, I I understand it's coming out of the blue at you, but here's our number in Manhattan. Call me back to to make sure it's authentic. So I did, and I said, Cosmo? I go, why me? I I flipped through the magazine, and I've seen the bachelors in there, and they always look like multimillionaires with their cowboy boot on the bump of their Ferrari or whatever. I said, I'm just this, you know, explorer, adventurer, freelance writer. And, and they said, no, 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 no. It's not always about money, Michael. In fact, we have a bet here in the Cosmo offices that you're going to break the record for the most amount of mail. Because what you offer a woman is, is the world and adventure and pushing your limits. And so then my publicist at HarperCollins, I ran it by her, and she said, Michael, are you kidding? You can't buy that kind of public. You, you know, a writer, a writer can't live in a garret or on a wilderness island anymore and just write. You've got to, you know, push books like they're boxes of soap now because it's a competitive world out there. And I go, Janet, really? I mean, this magazine seems kind of silly about orgasms and, you know, the covers alone, some of the titles, you know, it make people chuckle, but, you know, in every dentist office I'd pick them up. And, and she said, look, let me talk to uh, Cosmo and see if they'll put the title of your book in there. You know, they might not because that's considered advertising, but I'll, I'll put that in as a bargaining chip. So sure enough, Cosmo, you know, ran this little bio blurb on me, and, and they mentioned, you know, my first book. And my God, it flew off the shelves because Cosmo is published in 100 countries, translated into 87 languages. And then, of course, they put a, an address, you know, for people to, to email or to physically write to you. And I go, yeah, I'm going to get 10 letters. I would go to the P.O. box, like, you know, every other day, and the guys that work behind the counter of this little UPS mail center, whenever I came in, they all stopped what they were doing, and they circled around me to see the avalanche of mail pouring out of the brass box and landing at my feet. And there was more purple and pink ink. <laughs> Every eye was dotted with a heart. But and yeah, there were about ten, 10 different perfumes that were clashing at the same time. And every once in a while, a manila envelope would break open and the naked pictures would sprawl across the floor. It was like every man's fantasy. So I went from, like you were saying at the beginning, I went from famine to feast. No dates for two years in the wilderness, you know, living in Alaska. I come back to civilization, and it's almost as if the master of the universe said, hey, kid, walk into the candy shop. The lids are off all the jars. Help yourself. And all my male friends just went nuts because you're supposed to work for it. 
it's not supposed right. to, you know, come, not only come easy, but come in abundance like that. Mm. Uh-uh. Well, I have, I have to ask, what, as a female, okay, I have to wonder what kind of woman responds to this sort of thing. Now, now I, I do admit there were, there were a couple people in Alaska Men Magazine that, that I wrote, just, I mean, just, just a, a letter to uh, kind of acknowledge their profile and that, you know, I found them interesting and why and that sort of thing. No, no hitting on the person, certainly no naked pictures, <laughs> you know, no, no wedding proposals, just to acknowledge another human being kind of thing. So what motivates or what kind of woman, and, and you've met enough of them that you probably have a pretty clear idea about this, what kind of woman throws herself at somebody after reading an article about him in a magazine? There was, I would say, 50% of the letters were, and I hope this fairy tale is banned, that girls no longer hear this when they're growing up, and it's the Rapunzel story. And a lot of it was updated to present or modern times, present time. Here I am, alone, kind of bored in my little small town America, and can you come and get me out of my lonely tower and being a man, rescue me, give me a life. Right. There was a lot of that from, like, small-town America or people that were maybe stuck in their life and just wanted, you know, a man to sort of save them. And then, and, but what's funny also, whether they were Hollywood actresses, CEOs of companies, I would say 90% of the letters all started out like this. This was the first sentence. It's as almost as if they called each other and decided to write it the same way. The first sentence would be, Dear Michael, I have never, ever done this before. <laughs> but then the last sentence would also be the same. If you call me or come see me, I will blow your socks off. <laughs> of course. So there was this feigned... Some variation of that, I'm sure. Yeah, there was this feigned, you know, innocence of, oh my, you know, I wouldn't even think of, you know, and then at the end, if you're all in doubt, there will be a happy ending on first date. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. Like, but I mean, I, you can't really stereotype and say all the women that wrote. And another interesting thing that surprised when we were on Oprah Winfrey, she was surprised by this. I talked to psychiatrists. They were they're kind of surprised feminists. Is you would think that when you would take a Cosmo girl out to dinner or have her over or whatever, that. It's me, 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 me alone. But no, almost, I'd say 95% of the dates, they wanted to know about all the other Cosmo girls that I had dated before them. Really? And they wanted to see these letters, and they wanted to see the competition. Or It was the strangest thing. And in a lot of ways, it was very much a role reversal because Cosmo girls are very adventurous. And I had quite a few one-night stands that were initiated by females, which is normally kind of the guy thing. You know, like, okay, you know, we had sex and maybe I'll call you, that kind of thing. But a lot of them came up to visit and they knew it was for that night or for that weekend. Let's have fun and, you know, check in once in a while, but I don't have any strings. I'm not looking past the moment kind of thing. Well, they seem to do that. some women seem to do that, do that with musicians too. I mean, they don't care if they ever see them again. They just want to be able to say that they slept with whoever the person is, or be one. You of know, I think many. it's a different world now from our parents' generation. I think because what is it, fifty percent or sixty percent of marriages that fail now in the United States? I mean, as my dad says, you wouldn't buy a stock, you know, that fails that often. But yet, of course, whether it's Hollywood movies, happy ending, or whatever it is, not wanting to be alone, we continue to get married. But I'm finding that the modern generation of women are delaying marriage. There's more singles, I think, today than ever before. They're seeing the pain of divorce, a lot of it caused by infidelity, and they're going, wait a minute, maybe we got it wrong. Maybe we need to put marriage or relationships into a new paradigm. Maybe we need to be more honest about non-monogamy and, you know, the human animal and 
Cameron Diaz just came out a couple of weeks ago and had a big uh, thing about that. You know, what's so wrong with variety, having different people in your life, that sort of thing. There's a whole polyamory, amorous movement going on in the United States. So I got all of that during these dating experiences. And if I had to predict marriage in 100 years, I think marriage in 100 years is going to look very, very different than it does now. Because I just don't think it's working statistic-wise anyway. But for the ones it does work, oh, my God, it's the highest thing you can do here on Earth, you know. Well, I think that could be the amount of, of effort and preparation that goes into a lot of marriages could be an issue with that. I've talked about that numerous times on the show. But... Um, well, like one woman told me, she said, Michael, you don't have to work hard at being attracted to or falling in love ten times a day being attracted to other people, but you do have to work hard at monogamy. John Updike, the great author who passed away a couple of years ago, he said marriage is not natural, and what isn't natural doesn't last. So it's almost like we're walking contradictions because biology is destiny. And I know this is no excuse for cheating on a partner, but a man wakes up every morning and he has a billion new sperm to populate the planet with. A woman gets like one reproductive egg a month. You know, men, that's saying men are prone to roam, women are prone for home. You know, we're so doggone different. Like women are from Venus, men are from penis. You know, it's, <laughs> sometimes it's a wonder how we, we can match up and, and how we can stay together, you know. True. Yeah, first time you said that, quite that. Yeah, interesting spin on on women are from Venus, men are from Mars. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, just the physical act of sex, a woman takes a man inside of her. She internalizes. She has the the emotions, the caring, the sense of community. Whereas guys, it's external. And so many of my male friends, and being in locker rooms in my whole life as an athlete, I, I mean, I just know this to be true is that for men, they can have sex with, with women, and it's an aerobic workout, as horrible as that sounds. You know, they don't fall in love because they've done that intimate act. And not all women are that way either, you know, where they... But so many women told me, I just wish I could have sex like men. It would be so much easier. You could get all the benefits, almost like taking a drug of the relaxation or the de-stressing and... You know, so the war of the sexes, I mean, it, it's a tough one to overcome our biology because you can't just take millions of years of evolution of the human animal. And in fact, one of the characters in my book that I wrote concerning this issue, Ellen, she says it's like trying to capture a tornado in a teacup. <laughs> well, and even, even if a woman overcomes the, the biology, you know, that, that kind of leads toward the, the women being more emotionally connected, then you've got society to fight with. Because a woman acting like a man in a relationship and sexually is not treated the same way as a man. You know, the man's like, hey, f- high five, you know, pat him on the back kind of thing, and the woman is shamed for it. So lots of, lots of uh, internal and external issues to have to deal with. Well, you know, a buddy of mine said the other week, and, and I can agree with this. He said women are far more hornier and enjoy sex more than guys, but they're better at hiding it. There you and go. And it's like... Women have to hide it because of what you said. It's the whore and the Madonna, you know. And we don't want someone who's the mother with children still wanting to jump on the grocery clerk or whatever. But that's an adjustment. It's unfair. You know, and I mean, just the physical act of making love, a man has so many arrows in his quiver. But, you know, a woman can be multi-orgasmic. Yeah, I mean, almost limitless. So right so there. Look at a man if he, if he knows how. That's a whole yes. other topic. And I mean, tantra, <laughs> sex, and holding back and all that, which is, you know, oh my goodness, I've had extraterrestrial experiences on that level. But that's another story. But, you know, <laughs> it is such an insult. And I think today with Kim Kardashian and, you know, actresses, when they, quote, leak, you know, a porn video, somebody took it out of the bedroom drawer. I mean, come on. You know, how much right, she did bring right, you know, sure. her, her latest escapade, you know. Hmm. I, I can't imagine there's any mystery left to Kim Kardashian at this point. But anyway, ah. <laughs> so, so out of, you said, you know, about 90%. So what, what were the 
other women like? What are the ones that really stood out to you? Now, I'm sure the naked pictures did because you're a guy. But was there anything about some of the letters that stood out to you in a more positive, not all sexual way? Well, I got to tell you a couple of funny ones. Okay. There was a, uh, a prisoner in the Broward Correctional Institute, which is okay. in South Florida, which is sort of our tropics. New Orleans and you know Miami are kind of the, the Caribbean of, uh, of the mainland United States. And uh, she was incarcerated, but she okay. was allowed one phone call, I guess, on Sunday night. So the phone rang, and they would track my number down. I don't know how, but they would, you know, it was unlisted. Because Cosmo told me, change your phone number and get a P.O. box, not a home address, all that stuff. But, oh, definitely. You know, they found the number, and the phone rang one Sunday night, and it's Dolores. And she's calling me from prison and kind of apologizing. And, and I said, you know, with Dolores, sometimes bad things happen to good people. And I was trying to give her the benefit of the doubt. And I said, well, uh, by the way, what are you in for? And she said, oh, second-degree murder. And I went, whoa. But she said, I have a good lawyer, and I'm getting out in a couple weeks, and I need a boyfriend bad. (laughs) (laughs) And she goes, Michael, you won't believe it. You're the pinup in the prison. Somebody ran your Cosmo picture on the copy machine, and whenever I go out to the exercise yard, I look in just about every cell, and there you are on the wall with your dog team and your Alaska snow when it's so humid in this jail it can almost rain. And I'm going, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> and my literary agent at the time, when the whole Cosmo thing broke and Inside Passage was published about living on the island, We were having Chinese food once, and he said, dude, you have to take notes. Because Sigmund Freud once asked, what do women really want? You have got a shot at finding out. And then he actually gave me the the premise for the book. He said, why don't you study women like you studied the wildlife in Alaska? Use the scientific method. Try to keep your emotions out of it have the same baseline, wear the same sport coat, cook the same food when they, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, that went out the window on the first date, of course. <laughs> well, so the title of the book, I love titles that have double meanings or, more, or triple meanings. And the title of the book is Wild Life, two separate words. So it actually mm-hmm. means a life that is wild and it also means wildlife being animal. The Miss, M-I-S-S, Adventures of a Cosmo Vassal. So that was, you know, here's Dolores, the prisoner, getting out, and he's a boyfriend vet. Then a beauty queen from Memphis, Tennessee, called me up. And she had dated JFK Jr. a few times. And, I mean, she was just stunning, you know, brunette with that honey-dripping southern accent. And because everybody could read my book that was out there, they knew me pretty well because it's nonfiction, first person, inside passage. But, I mean, I wouldn't know these girls from Eve you know, when they called, other than scanning their letter and trying to keep up with the mail. So I just threw this out there one time on a phone conversation. And I was kind of getting, you know, too much dessert, too many dates and sugar shock. And I almost tried to scare her away, as beautiful as she was. And I said, Kim, what if I'm a serial killer? And in that Southern action, she said, then I'll die happy. <laughs> oh, wow. That's well. <laughs> That's a comeback. <laughs> and then, you know, uh, Kim came out. She stayed a weekend. And being the gentleman that I am, the first night after going out for dinner, we went back to my apartment. And I said, Kim, um, you take my bed, and I'll sleep out there in the living room on the couch. And she had these big brown eyes and long eyelashes. And she reached out and grabbed me my belt buckle. And she said, Michael, I didn't fly 3,000 miles to sleep all by myself. So it was the female as the adventurer, as the aggressor. And a lot of times I felt those tables were turned. And the culmination to that was I thought I'd be contribute to a good cause. There was a benefit called Bid for Bachelors, and I'm sure they go on in most cities, where they find a good cause like the United Way and single guys walk down this catwalk in a hotel, you know, wearing a tuxedo or whatever your – your theme is with your theme song and music playing and women actually bid on you for a date. 
And, of course, most of the dates are conventional, white limo, we go out to dinner. Well, I was able, because of my being a travel writer, to offer a weekend in Cabo San Lucas and, you know, deep sea fishing and, and all of that sort of stuff. But it's hard to believe, but I'm basically a very shy person. And you almost have to have that <laughs> really? side to be a writer, to sit alone in a room, as you well know. If you were a constant, you know, extrovert or outgoing or needed attention constantly, you, you wouldn't be able to do that, spend all those, those hours along. And I do have a shyness, but there's a saying that courage is a form of fear turned around. And I have forced myself to get out of the shy box because I want to learn things from other people and experience life. So I, am, I had heart palpitations. I couldn't get past that red curtain. Remember the scene was in that old movie, Monty Python, where they couldn't get to the stage because they got lost in the kitchen trying to, you know, even get out to perform? <clears throat> well, I'm that way with this big red velour, you know, curtain. I couldn't open the damn thing and find, you know, so they're, they're announcing, and now our grand finale, the Cosmopolitan, Mr. November, and, like, they keep playing the music. And finally, I, I pour out there. And because I was last, there were about 500 women that were definitely <laughs> liquored up, and they just went nuts. I mean, pinching my ass as I walked down the, you know, the, the catwalk, and I'm going, this is crazy. I'm a piece of meat. And now I kind of know what some women feel like, you know. Those were things you were being, getting, getting to peek at the other way, uh-huh. Yeah, and I almost felt like shouting out, hey, I need a little romance here. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'm a person. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was. I was a beer, ladies. I was a beer. <laughs> but I mean, these experiences, and Michael Larson was really my agent. You literally, it's hard for an imagination to conjure up what real life in a situation like this can give you because it was so surreal in so many ways. But then, now uh, that was a couple of funny examples, and then there were these just amazing women. In fact, I was thinking my first working title for the book was Meetings with Remarkable Women. And there was a Russian mystic named Gurdjieff about 150 years ago, wrote a book called Meetings with Remarkable Men. I was thinking of stealing his title and changing the name a little. Because some of them were just <clears throat> goddesses. I mean, they were divine teachers. And we didn't even go to bed. We just talked about spirituality and chakras and kundalini and i mean how you lucky know, was i to be privy to all of this fountain of wisdom and hilarity and rapunzel you know it was just you could not go to a university and, and buy that class it was right. phenomenal and you know i learned the expressions like foreplay is what you do all day men know how to tune up a car but don't know the first thing about how to turn on a woman you want to learn right now i mean it was practical information it was high vibe spirituality i had extraterrestrial experiences with one swedish woman i mean it just it opened up my whole life i would think so we can laugh like i did at the beginning and say how trite why even, you know, get involved with Cosmopolitan magazine? I want to be taken seriously as a writer. As a scientist, my book is about, you know, studying killer whales and bald eagles and the environment. You know, but Janet was right, the publicist at Harper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can serious yourself into no sales, too. So, and I've often learned now as a public speaker, if you want to impart wisdom, get people laughing up front. When you open right. up their hearts, then you can backload, you know, the serious message in the wisdom. So Very the good. Cosmo was kind of that. It was, you know, this frivolous, funny thing. And then it actually brought me a wife and a life partner. I'm, and I'm when, I met Helen, when I met Helen Gurley Brown, she was doing a book signing in Florida. And she was the one who picked me out of the pile of bachelors. And a lot of people ask, well, how do you become a bachelor? Well, it's a lot of coworkers that see a guy, know he's got good qualities, accomplishments, blah, 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 and they will submit him. Sometimes mothers do. <laughs> as weird as it sounds, once in a while a girlfriend sends her boyfriend's picture in, although I don't, you know, he's going to get deluged if he's, if he's picked. 
Yeah, so, really. Yeah, you know. But we met Helen Billy Brown, and I introduced her to Paula and said, Helen, thank you. You've given me the next chapter of my life. And even more importantly, I met Paula because of you. And the late, great Helen Gurley Brown, who died, was it, about a year, year and a half ago? She had tears in her eyes. And she said, she reached out and took each of our hands, and she said, you two are what my life's mission has been all about. And that is bringing people together. And the three of us are crying in a circle with hands connected. So I'm going, wait a minute. Why did I not want to do this? So I'm learning, pay attention in life, because sometimes opportunities come that we prejudge and we think right. that they're dumb or they're trite or they're not going to advance my career or life. Oh, my God, just the opposite. And I really believe that the best in this world are women. And I really believe that, you know, in fact, I don't know if this was somewhere in the Bible or it was in some religious script that women are so divinely beautiful physically and they're so wise internally that at one point far back in history, angels, if they do exist, actually came down to earth and married or cohabitated with human females. And I think that most men feel that way, that the, just if you take the female form, there's something divine about it. I mean, the curve of a woman's hip is where God lives. I mean, Picasso couldn't make that line. You know, and just the beauty, the overall beauty, and, and the real physical beauty to me comes from the inner light. When, when a woman's soul is developed as much as her physical beauty, I mean, she literally walks into a room like the sunshine. And I'm not saying men can't have that charisma or whatever, but, and of course, I'm biased being male. But what you're saying. <laughs> you guys are your goddesses. And for any man to treat a woman is less than that, to me, is a crime of the first order. So, so how, why, why did your wife stand out when she wrote the letter? Did, did she stand out immediately, or did it kind of take some time for you to... Well, you know, you're, you're so perceptive because... A lot of the mail was, can't believe I'm doing this. Come see me. I'll blow your socks off. You know, here's my, here's me naked. Um, lingerie. It was all pretty graphic and bold in a lot of the right. mail. I think they knew there were, you know, another thousand letters coming that week. Or, but the strange thing was, is I dated my way down two mailbags, and not, not every single letter. And I had a bunch of buddies, which is, is in the book, and um, we set up a mission control in an office. And one guy would just answer the door with all the bouquets of flowers and silk boxer shorts coming from Victoria's Secret. Somebody else was in charge of the faxes. One guy was crunching everything into the computer. You know, at one I'm point, it wasn't hard to find volunteers to help you with this. No. In fact, one of the guys was married. And his wife was cool with it because their sex life improved. So oh, there you go. Because he brought that energy home to her. And they had been married, I don't know, ever since they were like high school sweethearts, so they had been married like, I don't know, 12, 14 years, whatever, past the seven year rich times too. So he was bringing home, he was all charged up after we would, you know, meet at Mission Control. And she right. said, as long as you're not calling any of these girls, and I'm benefiting from it, is kind of kinky and weird as it is, it's refreshing our marriage. So go for Thank it, you. dude. So getting his mail or his uh, married take on this whole experience was funny. But at one point, Ralph, who was the computer geek, and he had this button on that said, save the mails, you know, because he was sort of, I don't know, misogynist a bit. And he said, hey, this was about halfway through the process. He goes, let's find out which part of the country in the United States and North America where you're getting the most mail from. And I go, all right, can you do that on the computer? He said, sure, I'll just run some, you know, code here. He goes, look at this, the American South, it's like three to one. And we're looking at each other like, why the American South? So one of the other guy goes, let's, let's call this woman, another beauty queen. Her name is Robbie. She's from South Carolina. Let's ask her. 
And I go, no, 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 no. He goes, yeah, let's find out why it's the South. Punch up her number. It was a Saturday. Sure enough, Robbie answers the phone. And her explanation was, Michael, we've all grown up on Gone with the Wind, and we are looking for Rhett. In fact, that was there the title of both at one time, too. <laughs> we are looking for a man who is handsome, a little bit dangerous, and who will sweep us off our feet. But you're but more also, likely today to meet Bigfoot than you are Red Butler. <laughs> and men hook you with that romance, but after a month or a year, you throw the bucket down the well, and that well is dry. Looking for Red. And in my Cosmo picture, I kind of looked like him, you know, with a twinkle in the eye and a mustache and... Even though I'm not set in Atlanta, I'm kind of set, you know, up in Alaska, but a slight resemblance anyways. <laughs> Interesting. I can, I can see that. Okay. All right. Well, in, in the that was, of, you know, that was the biggest thing, too, that if, the differences between men and women over and over you hear. And, of course, we are different creatures that way, is that lack of romance. Don't so, you think that, that Rhett had an appreciation for the fact that Scarlett was an independent woman, had a mind of her own? It's like she had both going on at the same time. Yeah. You know, yeah. and in Robbie's case, college graduate, you know, had a great career. But, and you know, it was interesting when I did date Miss Memphis, and I think I did hook up with Robbie at one point, and they're just ultra feminine in the South. And they're just so much fun to be with. And I guess I have a partiality to that southern accent. It just wraps around a man's heart like a solar ribbon. It's so beguiling, you know. I've heard that. And at one point I asked, I think it was Robbie, it might have been Kim, and I said, why are you guys like these ultra femmes? You're just so attractive, you know. And, and Robbie batted her eyes kind of as a parody of the Southern Belle. And she said, Michael, when we're young girls, we're standing in the kitchen washing dishes, and our mamas tell us all about you men. And those Yankee girls over there, they don't have a clue. Yep. So it's almost like they have us figured out. They know how to program, you know, the, the dating game. Interesting. Knowledge passed down, you know. That's it. Well, you got you know you're, you're so I, I I forgot to answer your question. I'm so sorry, but one day I'm dating my way down the the two mailbags, and there's a letter from a girl, fully clothed. It's a distance picture. I see you know her whole figure, but she's wearing sunglasses, and her letter was basically a resume of all of her accomplishments in life. Playboy Bunny lived at the mansion, good buddies with Hef, flight attendant of the year, corporate chef, graduate of seven chef schools, cooked for the corporate Campbell's Soup Yacht in the Caribbean. I mean, she had like, you know, 10 lifetimes packed in the, a third of one. And it just was like, here's what I'm all about. And in between the lines of her uh, resume wording, was, hey, buddy, I really don't need you. And if you want strength meeting strength, call me up. And, you know, a lot of men want to dominate a woman, and they're intimidated by that kind of power and strength, that Wonder Woman type. And, you know, that's, that's a load to handle because the man wants to be the alpha and in charge and all that. But I had had a previous pattern of trying to rescue people trying to, you know, save women and maybe if we get them exercising in vitamins, the Epstein bar will go away and blah, 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 blah. It was always an imbalance. And my dad told me, if you want to learn to play tennis, don't play with somebody you beat all the time, but play with somebody that runs your butt all over the court and your game will grow. Somebody that will challenge you. But you know what, Nikki, I got cold feet on our first date I, because she's so accomplished and intimidating. I turned the car around and I went home. <laughs> and I went back and I said there was traffic. So that, you know, that's why I was like that hour late. But that's how intimidating, how accomplished. So I broke my old pattern. 
I got out of that pattern of inequality with a woman, and I finally rolled the dice with somebody, I wouldn't say on my level, I would say on a higher level in many ways. And we've been married now over 12 years. So awesome. it's, so it's kind of like I've had this double life in that the lids are off all the jars, help yourself, and all my buddies saying, dude, bet him, don't let him. Don't ever get married. Look at this. You could date a, a different girl every night for maybe the rest of your life. But there comes a point where you want to build a life with somebody. You want that deep sharing and communication. And the weirdest thing with Paula, we haven't hit a ceiling, and I don't think we will. It just keeps getting higher and better every day. Well, you probably challenge each other in a lot of ways. Yeah, and you know, it's a cliche, but it's so true. This is how I feel about her, not only trying to get her to laugh all the time, because I just, I just love to hear her laugh and see her smile, but that saying that another, when another person's happiness is essential to your own, mm-hmm. and just seeing her happy. And the other day we were laying in bed, waking up in the morning, and she was kicking her feet under the blankets, and I thought there was something wrong, and I said, what's up? She said, Michael... I never dreamed I could be this happy. And whoa, I, you know, Mr. Macho, I just started crying then and there on the spot. If I would have checked out of this world or this life, that would have been fulfillment enough, knowing that I could make that one person that's close to me, you know, that happy. Very cool. So what does she think about the 5,000 women that threw themselves at Well, see, point? here's where I got very lucky. Paula's Swedish. And the Swedish have a different attitude about sex, love, love and lust. You know, they take the saunas together, nudity, no shame, sin, religion, all that stuff. So they're they're very liberal and open-minded that way. Also, she lived a very fast lane when she was in her late teens, early 20s. Not only being a Playboy bunny, she was an actress on... uh, you know, a lot of TV shows, Tom Cruise movies. You know, in those days, cocaine was, you know, nobody knew it was bad for you. And, and certainly at the Playboy Mansion. And it was, you know, that, that fast life. So she was her own Cosmo bachelorette, you might say. She had that time when she could click her fingers and there would be 50 men lined up outside her door. And the weirdest thing was, is she said, when she wrote her letter, it didn't start out, I don't know why I'm doing this. She said, I don't need to do this. Okay. And it's my niece who's putting me up to it. But <laughs> I thought I'd contact you because it says you love to travel, and I'm now a flight attendant, and I would love to find a man who actually had the time and interest to travel the world with me. You know, but she was least likely to have to, you know, write to somebody to try to get a date or whatever. So we kind of had that understanding, maybe like two actor, an actor and an actress dating each other because they right. know the life and they understand, you know, are they really saying I'm so great or is it the idea of me just because I walk a red carpet and I'm on a 50-foot silver screen? And I had, you know, my 15 minutes of uh, Warholian fame that way, being in Cosmo. And a lot of times I, I thought that way, that a lot of this mail and a lot of this interest is coming in because of the idea of who I am and Cosmo giving their stamp of approval rather than who I am really, you know, that kind of thing. So, so we both kind of had that fast lane, anything goes, you know, experience that we could relate to each other with. Right. Interesting. That would but who would think? I mean, not only, you know, Cosmo not wanting to do it, everything else, but it ends up giving me a wife slash life partner. I mean, never in a million years would I have, uh, have guessed, you know, that that would happen. <laughs> it's true. Mm. Well, plus, plus your buddy's got to have all that, that fun going through all your mail and looking at all your pictures. And Well, you know, another thing, too, while I'm taking notes to write this book, I'm also learning what makes women happy and what a man should do to improve 
And then I applied all of that to Paula that I had learned during those years. I funneled all that knowledge from, you know, maybe a thousand women that I was in regular communication, dating, blah, blah, blah. I mean, she kind of got the, the benefit of me and my learning experience. And that's why I decided to write this book. And this book, a lot of women go into it very suspicious, like no man deserves, you know, all of this without working for a blah, blah, blah. And he's going to be a jerk because he's just going to be notching his bedpost. But I made him resistant to the project at the beginning, and he's really a nerd inside of sort of a hunk's body because he was always a nerd his whole life, scientific, loved to read, that kind of a thing. But Alaska turned him into Tarzan, you know, chopping wood and being so physical up there. And a lot of women, when they read the book, and they go, oh, my God, this guy's devastating. He, he's irresistible because he puts it all together, you know. It's like Revenge of the Nerds, this smart spiritual guy, but he also, you know, has this uh, great exterior. And Paula, my wife, is a Virgo. She's very picky. So she said she didn't want to settle for a guy less than a man that had it all, or at least close to all as possible. So I feel very honored and complimented that way. Makes sense. So we need to we need to wrap things up. So how do people find out more about uh, the things that you've done and your book? Um, best way is Amazon.com. Okay. You, you just type in wildlife, two separate words. Misadventures of a Cosmic Bachelor, and then I'm sure as you do, uh, author page kind of has my bio, some videos, also social media sites. But Wildlife is out now as an ebook. You can download it to any device. I don't know if it's $4.99 or what the price is now, but uh, published by Corvallis Press out in Oregon. And uh, so much fun to write, too, you know. Definitely. But I had to uh, I had to change the names and places to protect the innocent and the guilty. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the lawyers told me to do that, but when I called a lot of the girls, they said, no, don't change my name. I want to be in, you know, I'm going, really? With all some of this graphic stuff, you know. So I got very lucky because Amy Tan wrote a blurb, and I mean, one of the great writers, Joy Lucklaw, Pat Conroy, Prince of Tides, he wrote something, his wife's a novelist, Cassandra King. But the blurb on the front cover that sells more books than, than all the others combined, and she's not even that literary, it's my own mother. And her <laughs> blurb is, oh my God, what did I raise? Yep, that, that's <laughs> the one that jumped off the page of me. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Your brothers and sisters are all married, and they have kids, and you've turned into this bachelor. I go, what's wrong with being a bachelor? uh, Italian mother guilt. Italian mother guilt and Jewish mother guilt, I mean, they're right up there, you know. I tell you, mothers of all stripes are very good at that. So are grandmothers. (laughs) And, you know, my mother is so, like, protective, and her whole attitude we were growing up was, oh, don't live, you're going to die. My worries from the womb to the tomb, you know. But thank God my dad was the other way. My mom was woe, and my dad was go. He'd come home, and he was an NFL football player with the Cleveland Browns, and he would come home, and he'd say, the only four-letter word I don't want to hear in this house is can't. You can do anything in life if you work hard enough. It's it. You know, so kind of had both in form. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, if if you say you can or say you can't, whichever one you say, you're right. So exactly, so true. I will say one the is psychiatrist positive. told me that I owe my life to my mother, and I go, "What do you mean?" And she goes, "Well, you've done all this extreme stuff and going into ice caves and kayaking with killer whales. If your mom said to you or both parents said, "Hey, just go do it. Go do anything you want," you'd probably be a CPA. Not that there's anything wrong with being an accountant. Mm-hmm you know, inside of a cubicle with Coke bottle glasses on or something, you know. So it's almost like reverse psychology. You went the furthest extreme from your mother's coddling you, you know. So I guess I do owe mom a big thanks that way. Yeah. Strange how life works. Remaining coddled and and whatever and and sheltered, you went out there and got into as much stuff as you could. I I would say you succeeded. But you know what? 
my parents didn't speak to me for over a year. When I quit my job, you know, as a freelance journalist, I was going around the world starving in between assignments, but I knew I had to roll the dice and try to write my first book, Live on This Island. My mother being Italian, I had to step over her body to leave. She laid in the doorway, and she, they have all these superstitions and visions, you know, like from Italy. <laughs> and she goes, oh, Michael, don't leave. My eye is twitching. It means death. Thank you for your support. <laughs> Thank you so much for being positive and behind me, Mom. Yeah, Got and it. then my dad being so practical, and rightly so, because he grew up during tough times, he goes, you do not quit a job without having another one lined up. Oh, yeah. So I don't care what age we are in life, you want your parents' approval. So I had to go into the cold, frozen north with a frozen soul, knowing that, you know, those who begat me were against me. But that kind of worked, too. In some lonely, dark moments, I said, I'm going to prove it to them, you know. Exactly. So maybe that was motivation, too, you know. I can thoroughly relate to that. Sometimes you just got to say, you know what? This was the right decision, and I'm going to prove it to you. Right. But, Nikki, do you find when you when you look <clears throat> back in life, do you see how the dots are now connecting? Even though at the time maybe you didn't want to go left, you know what I'm oh, trying yeah. to say? It's like our lives sometimes seem so haphazard and coincidental or accidental, but I'm really seeing now how I – did that to set up this sort of thing. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Consider the fact that everything that's happened in your life, the good and the bad, whether you wanted to do it initially or not, every one of those things has contributed and made you the person you are right this minute. There you go. That is excellent. That is so wise. Doesn't that kind of sum it up for you? Yep. People like to just block out and ignore the bad, but I mean the bad, the good, everything has made you the person you are right now. And if you feel good about the person you are now, you have to accept the good and the bad. And, you know, there was this educator named Piaget, and he once said, a mistake is just another way of doing things. Exactly. You know, Everybody makes a mistake. I figure make the mistakes, don't make the same one over and over again, and learn from them. Bravo. There you go. All right. Well, we have to go, Michael. Been, it's been very entertaining. Thank you, yeah. Nikki. Listen, this is one of the best interviews I've ever done. It's just like I it feel like two spirits link up in a way we went. I mean, that was like, again, out there of space go. time thing, you know. There you go. <clears throat> All right. And I will see the listeners next week on Ready for Love Radio. Mm-hmm.